guys. I'm Phil Town. And I'm Danielle Town. And we're here to talk about Rule 1 Investing, Invested. About being invested. About being invested. I know. I love that name. <laughs> <laughs> it has so many connotations. It does. To it really get it in deep. depth to it. Yeah. I dig it. Which is how I'm trying to feel about this whole thing. But it has, and, and it has really, depth to it. You know, it's really fundamental to great investing is to be committed. Yeah. Uh, good you point. know, it's, I think it's fundamental to great anything is to be committed, right? Sure. I mean, think about, you know, a baseball player who's taking a swing at a ball. It's like, you're going to hit it out of the park. You better be committed to it, right? You're going <laughs> to fully engage. And so many people that I've worked with in my life have convinced me that their own greatness came about as a result of being really committed. Well, it's like the 10,000 hours thing that's become almost a hackneyed trope at this point <laughs> but you know it's the same it's that yeah. thought it's like if you're going to be into something put the time in and you'll get good at it i don't want you guys to think you have to put in ten thousand hours all right <laughs> because that could be a little intimidating that's what it's five years of full-time work yeah i think it is before you consider yourself to be you know a competent you know investor um well, that's why I Gosh, said it's like a hackneyed kind of trope. That's scary. I mean, we should hang this podcast up <laughs> if it's going to take you well, a right. lifetime. I, I mean, it's obvious that it depends on what you're doing and who you are and where you started and your talent level and your natural abilities. Like, those are all things that make a difference in how many hours it's going to take you to become really, really good at something. But I think the point of it is that it's worth attention and time and practice and focus and being invested in it. I think, I think the solution to the time problem is that after 10,000 hours, you won't have to think much about this stuff. I mean, Warren Buffett has a bazillion hours involved and he claims that somebody could bring him any company, any company, and he can tell you in 15 minutes if he's in or out. Hmm. So all those 10,000 hours, that becomes a virtuoso in performance, right? There are some companies I can tell you about that, but what not any What does he do company. in those 15 minutes? I, that's a great question. I, you know, I don't think anybody's ever asked him that. Oh, come that on. That I've ever heard of. And I'm talking about guys that spent a million dollars to have lunch with him and took notes. That is the most obvious they question. They didn't come ask on. him that. <laughs> what? Okay, so if I... I bet he looks at the big four growth numbers. <laughs> <laughs> I bet he already knows them for the industry. And probably by the time they show up, he's already done the 15 minutes. But yeah, I think he's going to look at the growth numbers. Charlie Munger said he's never seen Warren Buffett do a calculation. Ever. Wait a second. What does that mean? It means that he's got it in his head. That Oh, like he hasn't written down a calculation. Right, he hasn't written down a calculation. Okay. And to my knowledge, you know... The, I know that Buffett has said that the value of a business is its future cash flow, and that this, the only thing that really makes any sense about investing in businesses is to understand them in terms of future cash flow. And most of us have to run some numbers, but if you got, you know, after a while, you start to see a few things about a business that are the key things that we're teaching you guys, and you can look at a business and say, wow, they've got those key things or they don't. Hmm. You know, hmm. Jim Cramer does a lot of really off the cuff analysis on on mad money and the secret to it is that he has a really pretty lightning recall of industry groups so if somebody says a company he's got it on his computer you'll see him reach over to the desktop right and he'll he'll bang it out and you'll see immediately what industry group or subgroup that thing's in and if let's say it's uh, arch uh, company and he goes oh okay that's coal boom and here comes his analysis coal is you know on the way down not a great place to be <clears throat> hit the buzzer don't invest right mm -hmm. and it's not a decision around arch who he may have never heard of it's a decision around the coal industry and where that's going and i think to a certain degree that's what warren does as well because there are a lot of industries he doesn't invest in and i know for us we do the same thing we really isolate down into what we call the canyon, right? Into the area that we feel comfortable with. And over time, what all those hours of investing do for you is they broaden the walls of the canyon. You have more things you can see and think, yeah, that, that's something I can get into. Yeah, I think that kind of practice into anything creates an automatic response or an automatic kind of shorthand in your body, in your mind, so that you can quickly skip past or almost to the point where you don't even realize you're skipping it. You go so fast 
through those basic steps onto whatever it is that requires your attention right? based on whatever level you're at. I mean, it's like learning a new sport. Like first you're learning tennis, you have to learn how to hold the racket. Then it becomes second nature of how to hold a racket. You don't need anybody to tell you that. (laughs) Then it's about how your stroke is. And then once you get your stroke down, it's like, all right, where's the ball going to go? It's just these steps that you go through learning anything new. And and I think there's a, there's, have we talked about like the steps of mastery in our podcast so far? I don't know if we have. Well, I think it applies here. Anyway, if it's being repeated, my apologies, but I think it's worth repeating. And that is that when you start something new, you are kind of unconsciously incompetent, right? I mean, you don't know how to hold the racket. Right. You don't know yeah, how to I think swing you've said it. this, yeah. And then once you get going on, like you start working on it and you become more and more aware of how to do it properly, you become consciously incompetent. Right. You're aware <laughs> of everything you're doing wrong. Ah, it's, uh, this is just like agonizing, it's torture, right? Torture, yeah. Torture. And then you keep working on it and you put in some of those hours and you become consciously competent. But you have to think about it. And in investing terminology, your canyon is only so wide, right? But it's widening and you're pretty competent within that canyon. And then you continue to go and you get to where Buffett is and you become unconsciously competent. You don't run numbers. You don't do the obvious things that a consciously competent person does because you just have it, right? You don't have to think about it. Mm -hmm. So what I think we can say as we're starting off this, we've got an awful lot of people listening to us who are in the unconsciously incompetent, working toward consciously incompetent level of agony here. And investing and trying to decide if it's worth it to be in that mode. Right? Yeah. I mean, and how, how long right. do you have to stay in that because mode? Because that mode is very uncomfortable. Oh, man. It is. And when we start thinking about investing our own money, we jump right through the unconsciously incompetent. We, we're, we're done with that in, me, in a heartbeat. We know. We don't know. Yeah. Because that's real money. And that's our retirement. And that's our life of our family. And our kids being able to go to college or, or, or not, us not having to move back in with them. So <laughs> it's, it, it's very scary right off the bat. We know we're not competent and we know we don't know. And that's what freezes people and gets them moving money to professionals who are frankly, <laughs> I mean, if you take it Warren Buffett's word for it, the professionals are incompetent because Buffett says that the only reason to diversify a portfolio is because you don't know what you're doing. So naturally you have to diversify. And here you are giving your money to a professional who immediately diversifies it, indicating from Buffett's point of view, he's incompetent. Yeah, we've got to talk about that diversification question. And we mentioned the other day about um, allocating a portfolio, which is a cousin of that question. Oh, yeah. And I feel like that's a lot. A lot of people ask me about ask me to ask you about that. <laughs> we should we should really devote some time to that. Well, let's devote a minute and then okay. we'll come back with a whole podcast on it because I think it's important for everybody to understand at least the ballpark we're in in terms of investing strategy that the more you what we would say over diversify, the less your rate of return. In other words, you're you're taking away the benefit of all the good decisions by throwing in a pile of junk in this massive diversification process. Um, And the ultimate statement of massive diversification are these new robo-advisors where you go online to a website. I've heard about these. Yeah, and they're replacing financial advisors as they should If all you're going to get out of your financial advisor is a modern portfolio theory, diversified portfolio, what do you need to be paying them 1% for? And I think some of them, even you can set them, as we've been saying, we want to invest where our values are. I think you can set them to certain value-based investing decisions. Some ETFs. It's actually that really interesting. To choose. I don't know. I haven't I, I haven't really looked into them, but a friend of mine was telling me about them. But it's all very formulaic, right? It's, well, it would it, have like, to be. It's a computer program. Yeah. And yeah. so what you do is you take that little test we talked about last time <laughs> that's absolutely brain dead and says, I would, I'm, which do you want? Low risk, low return or high risk, high return? And they don't give you the choice of low risk, high return, right? There's not a choice for the robo advisor or any other advisor. Um, so you put in your little thing and it it puts you on a scale of one to 10 in terms of risk. 
and then it builds a portfolio defined by modern portfolio theory that has more or less risk. And the way they define risk in these robo-advisors and also at your financial advisor, at Morgan Stanley, is that they use a beta of a stock, which is the, the amount it moves around relative to the S&P 500. So if your stock's bouncing all over the place, up and down, or even just up, it's going up like a rocket, they will say it's very risky because it has a high beta. In other words, it's moving around more volatile than the S&P 500. Now, does it seem strange to you guys that the movement of a stock price would indicate its risk? Because it's an academic notion that Warren Buffett says is absolute nonsense, complete crap. And yet all of modern portfolio theory is based on it being true. That risk is identifiable by how much a stock is moving around. And well, I think it you depends. have a look on your face like, hmm. It, well, it would depend on whether or not you need to sell at a certain point in time. Well, not necessarily. I mean, let me give you an example. So, so well, let me give you an example first. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> um, so if I know that I have to sell three months from now, like exactly 90 days from now, mm-hmm. I'm going to want to choose a company that would where the price would move around less or not at all, really, because I want to have some certainty in where that price is going to be. Like I, it, uh, on day 90, it could be way down just by total happenstance. And then I'm just screwed because I happened to hit day 90. Right. And for, and for whatever reason, I had to sell on that day. Right. So if I have flexibility in when I sell and if I can keep it long term, then I don't think I care when the price goes up and down. But if I have some sort of outside reason that makes me have to sell, then I think I would care. Well, the classic part of modern portfolio theory in regard to your, your example is that it says nothing about whether that's going to be down in 90 days. You could pick the least risky stock in the market. And modern portfolio theory says nothing about whether that's going to be down in 90 days. All it says is that it's going to be down in 90 days if the market's down in 90 days. But my risk that it'll be down is much, much less than on a stock that goes all over the place. Why? Because it's staying on a nice little flat line trajectory. No, right? it, it's, it's not... Low risk doesn't mean a flat line trajectory. Low risk stocks went down 50% in 2009. So low risk stocks follow the market. Exactly. Okay. Okay. So yes. that's the definition of a... That, of is, a that is a different thing though. Oh my gosh. It's vastly different. It's an academic hypothesis that makes no sense in the real world. Now let me, let me tell you about... What, yeah, that's totally different than I was imagining. It. Yeah. And a volatile stock might be one which used to be going along at the same as the S&P 500, but like Gildan that we were talking about last time, yeah, went down 75% recently. So now you can buy Gildan at $15, but the volatility of it has gone through the roof. Now it looks like if you just went on that basis, the riskiest stock in the stock market, when it's probably the least risky stock. Buffett puts it like this. Which is more risky, buying Gildan at $45 a share or buying it at 15 Assuming, less risky assuming is, the company hasn't less changed risky at all. Is buying it at 15 Assuming the company hasn't changed at all, <laughs> it's less risky to buy it at 15 And yet when it went from 45 to 15 its risk, according to modern portfolio theory, went straight up. Because of that huge drop. Because of the huge drop. Yeah, because everybody who owned it at 45 lost a ton of money. Yeah. Well, they assuming, they, assuming that they have to sell for some reason. Well, it doesn't even care. Just modern portfolio theory just doesn't care. It doesn't even care which direction the movement is. It could have gone up as much as that, and it would be considered vastly risky. It's just movement. And this idea was created by academics as some way to calculate how to build a portfolio with more or less risk in it, because that's what everybody wants to do, right? They went, okay, I want to make high rates of return. Well, you have to take more risk. This is absolute nonsense. Hmm. That risk and reward are necessarily connected is really stupid. It's obvious that it's not true. I mean, consider this. If I go out and drive my car to work, I have a little risk, but I'm not, you know, writing my will every morning, you know. (laughs) 
It's, I'm not going through Baghdad. That's right? because you only need one will, just so you know. <laughs> okay, good. <laughs> well, I still wouldn't ride it. I would. I would be very confident of getting right, to work. Right. You're not. You're not riding a bike through Kabul. No, you're, I'm not riding a bike through Kabul. You're driving your car through. Yeah, through just traffic in you know Georgia. It's nothing big deal. Yeah. All right. Now, same starting point, same vehicle, same journey, same endpoint. But now I get my. 12 year old niece to drive me who's never driven a car in her life. Now suddenly the risk of getting there has gone to 100%, right? I have no chance of getting there. <laughs> <laughs> so risk and reward aren't necessarily connected. They're, the, the difference between me driving and her driving is knowledge. So if you put, if you, the academics have taken the notion of knowledge out of the formula completely. They have removed the notion of knowledge. Hmm. And there's a whole story about how that could possibly happen. But trust me here, it did. And so there's no question about knowledge when it comes to stocks for academics. They don't care if you know anything about it or not. And yet, if you know a lot about it, certainly your risk would be lower. A few podcasts ago, I think companies are made up of people. It's all about knowledge. It's all about who the people are. It's all about what they do every day. It's all about how that company is run and structured and incentivized. I don't see how knowledge... It, it's, not, it's not a monolithic entity that just moves along at its own pace of its own will without any human interaction. I mean, it's entirely human interaction. <laughs> exactly. That make these things happen. It's just a, an entity of humans. So I don't see how... How could you possibly... On the other hand, okay, so I'm saying this knowing absolutely nothing about this theory. Right. And thinking to myself, I should probably go read a book about it so that I can... And I can recommend you one for you. More intelligent questions. I can about recommend this. a book for you for the guy who wrote the book on this modern portfolio theory. It's written by Burton Malkiel, who's a uh, professor emeritus at Princeton. He wrote the book in 1973. It's still in print. So I'll go read that. And it's called Random Walk on Wall Street. But my guess is. Oh, that and by the way, it's absolute crap. So my guess is what I was about to say is that he's probably an intelligent person who thought to himself, companies are made up of people. I have to do something about this. And there's a reason that I'm going to take knowledge out of this equation. Yes. And the reason is okay. because of a hypothesis that says that the market is very efficient. And we've talked a little bit about this, that rational people wouldn't sell something for $10 that's worth 20 and they wouldn't buy it for 20 if it's only worth 10 that's rational people. So Burton Malkiel and all the other academics who are very rational and sitting in the little ivy towers and make things up and have never in their lives been actually in the trading floor or actually in the, in the, um, in, in the um, Wall Street casino <laughs> and seen what kind of incredible emotion is around managing $6 billion and being scared your kids aren't going to go to kindergarten next year if you screw this up because last year was horrible for you and your boss is telling me, what are you doing? What, what's wrong with you? You're, you're not keeping up with the peer group. Yeah. It's very scary to run one of those things. I mean, think about it. The guys who run these funds are the smartest guy in the room in high school. Then they went to Harvard, and they were the smartest guy in the room at Harvard. And then they went to Harvard Business School, and they graduated at the top of their class there. And then they got into Goldman Sachs's program, and they became the top guy in the program. And they got a mutual fund to run. My God, can you imagine what that guy has at stake? Those, a decade of hard, hard work to excel against really smart people. And now he goes out in a matter of a matter of a couple of quarters, does badly with this fund and he's fired. End of story. And it happens all the time out there. So Wall Street's a very scary place for these guys. And there's a huge amount of emotion, of emotion around managing money. And for that reason, the idea that the marketplace is a very rational place where people just rationally do these rational things is just an academic fiction. And in that academic fiction is this notion that price is equal to value. And we were talking about that last time. Mm -hmm. Price is equal to value. And Warren Buffett has said over and over again, price is just what you paid. Value is what you got, right? So if you're out there chasing the, the hottest new car in the market, and it happens to be Maserati coming out with this beautiful quadruponte thing. And you go into the dealer on, uh, on, uh, on Madison in New York and they say, hey, here's a, you know, sit in this beautiful car. And you do and you say, well, how much is it? And they say 140000 And you look at the sticker and the sticker's 112. 
<laughs> and you're going, wait a second. How come it's 140? And so, oh, well, everybody wants one. You want to get one soon. You know, if you don't want to wait a year, it's 140. Okay. So are you getting a $140,000 car? No. You're getting a $112,000 car. Well, right? or you're getting a $140,000 car because that's what it costs in order to get one today. Which is what Burton Malkiel would say. Yes. Right? And so in the long uh, journey through the stock market, you know, what, what that Burton Malkiel takes you on, on this, on this book, Random Walk on Wall Street, he gets around to pointing out that when that nobody does it no that in fact what you're saying is if if you paid 140 it's 140 dollars a thousand dollars of value the price is the value that's a statement right and the backup for that statement is that mutual fund managers don't beat the market so if people could buy things that are on sale and sell them when they're overly priced then mutual fund managers would be beating the market all over the place but they don't they don't beat the market almost any of them for any length of time so Burton Malkiel and all these academics have this data that says, oh, we're right because nobody beats the market, except that damned Warren Buffett. <laughs> I think you said, though, that for commodities like a car, price does equal value. If I could buy that car at $140,000 and then walk out the door and sell it to somebody else for $140,000, that's its value, right? It's just a commodity and... The nuts and bolts of that car didn't cost $140,000 to make. They probably didn't even cost $112,000 to make. They're making a profit on it. Well, the a, value car, of a it, car isn't a commodity per se, right? No, Com it's not I mean, a typical a commodity. commodity. I money. just mean it's compared. To, so what you were saying was that a company is different because it generates cash flow. Right. A car does not generate cash flow, I guess, unless you rent it out. Right. So the value could be more okay, Picasso-ish. Than... There's, a, there's a minor cash flow there. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Uh, and, and you could make the case that the car value... There's an Uber value proposition. <laughs> <laughs> well, you can always make the case that the car value can... That, that the car value isn't the price. Because here you've got one price at 140000 And I guarantee you, the day that I was looking at that car, there was somebody out there willing to sell one of those things for ninety. I just don't know where they are, right? Some guy going through a divorce, some guy who lost his driver's license because he got caught drinking and driving, whatever, right? right? People go through these ups and downs. Uh, a much better, um, I think a much better metaphor for this idea that, that price is not necessarily value and that you can get bargains is one of our students is a, a professional mink coat buyer and seller. And she, she just goes to garage sales and flea markets and buys mink coats. And she buys them in part because they're politically incorrect and therefore people have an emotional need to get rid of them cheaply. They don't care anymore what it's worth and they'd rather not deal with the eBay and they just dump them. And so she knows a good one from a bad one. She buys a $6,000 mink coat for $300 and sells it on eBay in a week for 1000 And so she's constantly finding bargains in the market because people are emotional, not necessarily rational. And so a book that came out to prove that Burton Malkiel's book was stupid is a book that came out in 1999 by Robert Schiller at Yale called Irrational Exuberance. And in it, he proves to economists, in economist language, that Schiller's wrong, or that Malkiel is wrong, that the market is not efficient, that price is not value, that in fact you can buy into the market at times when it's cheap and you can sell it in times when it's expensive, and your rate of return over 20 years could range from 0% to 14 or 15%, depending on when you bought in. So the proof is out there, and the paradigm is changing now, but the SEC hasn't changed it, so your financial advisor is still thinking that the right way to manage a portfolio is massive diversification, because all things are priced at their value. So what would be the point of doing any homework? If you can't get a deal, why would you bother reading about a company? And so ultimately, they don't. Yeah, Isn't that, I, don't, I don't know why you would. Well, of course you wouldn't because you can't get a deal. I don't know why you would even bother buying any companies. I would just buy the index. Well, yeah. And that's essentially what these robo-advisors do. They just buy the index. Although I heard a couple of them now are going to allow you to kind of pick stocks, which is just, why would you if you believe in efficient market theory? You wouldn't pick stocks because everything is the same. It's all priced at its value. You can't get a bargain. So all you would do is you would see, gee, what's less risky and what's more risky according to my test that I took. I will buy more high beta, high volatility stocks if I've got a long time to be in the market 
and I can ride the ups and downs, which are going to be more in a diversified portfolio of high volatility stocks than if I'm buying a bunch of blue chips. But guess what? If the market goes down 50% next year, your blue chips are going down 50% next year, mm -hmm. and your big volatile stocks, they're probably going down 60. <laughs> you know? So the, the thing that Buffett came out and said is that, you know, what Burton Malkiel said in, uh, in his book was that Buffett was essentially a, a monkey flipping coins. Because in every random, see, if all prices are equal to values, that makes the market just random. And he got lucky. And he got lucky for 50, 60 years in a row, <laughs> right? And so Buffett in 1988 went to um, Columbia University. He, he gave a lecture called The Investors of Graham and Doddsville, and you can look it up and, uh, and, and read it, and it's fantastic. And basically he said, okay, well, it's possible that I'm a monkey flipping coins, and I just don't know that I've just been lucky. Um, and it's even possible that there's some other monkeys out there flipping coins, that have gotten massively lucky, because I know, you know, there are other guys who have had a big track record. But he said, what if all the monkeys were in the same zoo? Wouldn't <laughs> that be non-random? And then he pointed out in the lecture, all of these investors are investing basically the same way, which is what was taught by Ben Graham and further taught by Warren Buffett, and this is what I'm teaching you guys now, is how to invest like the investors of Graham and Doddsville and become one of those lucky monkeys. That's lucky monkeys. That's what we want to be, is we want to be one of Burton Malkiel's lucky monkeys. <laughs> we don't care if people call us lucky monkeys if we're making great rates of return, right? Totally. Yeah. So we believe, in fact, that price is what you pay, value is what you get, and that there are reasons why companies do go on sale. And we, we started into that with this notion of events, which put companies on sale. And we'll get more into that next time. But for right now, we want to be sure we cover something really important. And that is that we promised we'd show you guys how to figure out the sticker price. What's the value of a business? Because if businesses are not always priced according to their value, we need to know what their value is so we know whether it's on sale or whether it's not. So shall we dive into that a little bit here? Yeah, I do want to say that I think there's a lot more to talk about with this whole risk and volatility and efficient market theory and et cetera, et cetera. There I, think, is. I think we should discuss this more. Okay. Well, we could discuss it more now, but no, I'd no, no. rather kind of go through this. I mean, I mean this. like over the next years of this <laughs> podcast. like. <laughs> and we can. Um, because Malkiel himself has modified his theory hmm. since he wrote it up. Since it became a little bit ludicrous that companies could be worth $100 one day and three months later with nothing changing in the company, they're worth 20 Hmm. if price is value. So when these big market shocks happened in 2000, and again in 2008, um, it really upset the apple cart for efficient market theorists, right? That, uh, that what was obviously a short-term phenomenon could suddenly change the value of business massively. Yeah, right? when it's, yeah. yeah. So yeah, I think this is really interesting. This is, this is something that I find interesting. <laughs> <laughs> I do too. We have found something. <laughs> I do too. I, so it, I'm going to try to use this as a way to, to, to make an inroad. Well, we really should dive into this at, at, because there's this controversy is raging right now in academia um, because there are schools of this, right, where these guys have anchored their entire academic, um, their, their entire academic um, career is based on efficient market theory and the modern portfolio theory being true. Well, and I'm sure that there are investment banks whose entire investing system is based on one or those one or more of those theories. Yeah, but that, all they want you to do is keep being stupid. So <laughs> they're not nearly as as in emotionally attached. They're just financially attached to your uh, acquiescence that the financial services industry has your best interest at heart and they're just gonna do the very best they can for you by diversifying your portfolio and charging you, you know, somewhere between a robo-advisor 0.5% to a Morgan Stanley guy is gonna charge you one or 2%. And they're getting rich on your money. They're getting rich on it. And so they're gonna, they're gonna hang with the paradigm as long as they can. Um, but it's academics who have their emotional attachment to it because some of these guys got the Nobel Prize in economics for this theory. Hmm. Oh, yeah, there's some great stuff out here. You want to read a book by about this? Read um, The Black Swan by Nicholas Taleb. Mm -hmm. Brilliant, brilliant book. Now, there's a guy who used to be a, a, an options trader, then became an academic, and was shocked 
at the way these academics view the world, right? So he wrote this book called The Black Swan, which is all about the market being inefficient and having these events that should not come along in a random system once in 80 billion years, and they come along about twice a year. <laughs> <laughs> Cool. Yeah, very, very okay, cool. Okay, so we're going to dis- this is, this, I think this is going to be an underpinning to what we discuss. Yeah, I, I would love time. to get into to Taleb at some point. Yeah, we should. I'd love to have him on here. Anti fragile. Anti fragile's his opus. We're going to talk all about that. Yeah, it's fabulous. Okay, so let's talk about sticker price. Okay, so let's assume for a second that we're actually right that the Warren Buffett, Ben Graham, Graham and Doddsville School of Investing, which we call Rule One Investing, um, focuses on making sure that you don't lose money. And the way we do that is make sure we understand the business and then that it's durable and it's got good management and then we can figure out the value. So let's dive into how we might figure out the value here. And then we go through a pretty simple calculation and I'm, I'm going to put these notes on our, on our show notes, okay? And I'll, I'll put up an Excel spreadsheet that you can download. Um, but you can also look up this uh, that I, I wrote about it at length in rule number one. The book. Um, the your, book your first my, book. Yep, my first book. It's, um, I don't know, chapter six or something. <laughs> it's, been, it's been 10 years, all right? So I forget Dad, which, which chapter. chapter is it? I can't remember. <laughs> I can't remember. I'm getting old. So I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to lay it out there for you. So you don't need to go buy the book and you don't need to use the tools that are on the rule1investing.com website. Um, yeah, I just, just want to know, I, like, I don't really want to do this calculation, obviously, right, right? but I would like to know how it is done in case I ever have to do it. Right. And is I want to know what that button I'm going to click on means. does. Right on. Yeah. So here's the way we figure things out. We start with what are the earnings of the company right now? All right. Now, the, that's really you mean easy. for the most recent year? Yeah. For, what we call it is that you'll see this notated as TTM. EPS. And what that means is trailing 12 months oh, okay. earnings per share. So TTM just means give me the latest 12 month data, right? And so it's the most up to date you can get. And um, so that's called TTM EPS. So we need to know that. So that's the first piece of data we've got to have. And we can get that by going over to um, Yahoo Finance, for example, it's a free site. You go, you Google Yahoo Finance, click on the main uh, URL and then put in the symbol of the stock you want to get information about. And on the page that comes up, there will be a number down on mid-right side of the page that says EPS parentheses, TTM parentheses. And it'll be a number like Apple is $8.65. Okay, I can do that. All right, cool. So that's TTM EPS. That's the first number you need. Second number you need is a growth rate. And the growth rate is something that you um, can do, can get one of two ways. Either you figure it out like we were talking about last time by looking at the big four growth numbers, which you called the historical moat mm-hmm. numbers, which I like. We're going to change the website for that. And, um, and then you, you get, take your best guess, right, based on your knowledge of the business. What should be the growth rate for the next 10 year, 15 years? What, what, what could this company sustain because of this intrinsic characteristic that keeps its profit margins, right? And if you're not too sure, then you look up the analyst's estimate for growth. And, and what you can look up on Yahoo Finance is called uh, estimates or analyst estimate. And you click on that and it'll give you their estimate of growth in earnings over the next five years, what they're estimating growth to be. Okay. So again, that's something you can just look up. So growth of earnings. Growth of earnings. Rate, growth rate of earnings. Yep. And that that's called analyst estimates. And so, and on our website, you just click on margin of safety calculator. It comes up already loaded in. Okay. What the TTM uh, EPS is and what the analyst estimate of growth is. Okay. So the only reason you change that is if your growth rate after careful study is lower than theirs. That's which right. Which sometimes yes. it is. Yes, I remember you said that. Okay, so Apple's estimate of growth rate by the analyst is 14%. Okay. 14%. So we, we just look it up. There it is. All right, now the next number you need is the P-E ratio. Now P-E ratio, P-E stands for price earnings. And it's just a formula that if you wrote it out as a formula, you'd say price divided by earnings equals P-E ratio. So what would that be? Well, let's say the earnings of Apple is $8.65, and 
and the price of Apple is uh, $86.50. Do you use the price today? Yeah, today's price. So it changes up and down like mm -hmm. that. So you say, okay, well, if Apple's earning $8.65 and its price today is $86.50, then it has a PE of 10. You divide $8.65 into $86. So whatever the price is today, you take that trailing 12 months EPS, divide it into it, and that'll give you the actual PE. Okay. Okay. Now, what we want to know is, What's the PE going to be in 10 years? And the way we find that out is we look at, we make this. Yes, the, that would be nice to know. Yeah. <laughs> we make the assumption that the company um, has a certain growth rate, right? We've already covered that. And now we figure out what's the PE that goes with the growth rate. And there's a really simple thing you can do here, okay, that makes this easy. It takes all the mystery out of it. And that is that over a long period of time, you know, many, many years, the average PE of the stock market for the average company in the stock market is 15 times earnings. Okay. Okay. So in other words, if the earnings were a dollar, the average price of that stock would be 15 times a dollar or $15. Now that can fluctuate widely. Okay. But that's the average in, in the good and bad markets average. All right. Now it also turns out that the average growth rate over the last 140 years of these same companies is around 7 to 7.5% 7 a, a year. Okay. Right? So if you divide 7.5% a year, or 7.5% into 15, you get 2. In other words, 2 times the growth rate gives you the PE. In 10 years? No. Now, on average, just on average. Oh, just the average PE. Yeah. So you'd say, okay, what's the growth rate of this company? 14. What's the PE? What should the PE be? Well, it should be two times that. Two times 14 is 28. So it turns out that in good markets, now this isn't gonna be the case for bad markets, right? Bear markets, PEs go way, way down. In bull markets, PEs go way, way up, or they certainly can. So we're just gonna say, we're gonna stipulate that for our purposes, we're only gonna sell this business in a good market. We're gonna sell it when it's a bit overvalued, perhaps. And so we are going to use either the lower of, we're going to use the lower of either two times the growth rate, which in the case of Apple is 14 times two, which is 28. We're going to use that for the PE or the historical high PE. Why are we using such an optimistic number? Because we're going to try to arrive at a real-world value for this company. Not what it would sell for in a fire sale. Not what it would sell for in an average market. But the price that these guys would actually get if they tried to sell this company. And it's, it's going to be bigger than what the market probably says right now. Right? Because companies, when, particularly because we're going to sell the company only in a good market. We're going to buy it in a bad market. So we're going to buy when there's fear. We're going to sell when there's greed. When there's greed, it's a good market. It's rah, rah, boom, boom. Everything's going to go up forever. And then the PEs go up. So we're going to sell it when it's got a higher PE. And this helps us arrive at a really good estimate of what the current value really is. Okay. Right? We've been so conservative with all of our numbers so far. So I'm surprised that we're going with a optimistic calculation on this one we are because we are going to hammer it with a margin of safety okay <laughs> we're, we're going to discount it radically okay and then and that'll bring back in that conservatism okay so what is sorry what number are we talking about here this one that's the lower of two times the growth rate or the historically high it's the pe, PE. and, and oh, make but a we note already here. calculated the pe well we we calculated the pe of apple as being 28 yeah right so we're now going to go look at its historical PE, and we're going to find out if Apple has ever oh, had so a 28. we're just trying to see if 28 is like crazy, crazy. today, or if it's yeah. really low today. Because some industries okay. have perpetually... This is like a check on our PE It's number. a check on our PE okay. number. Because some industries have perpetually low PE numbers. If they're, if they're an industry that up, goes up and down with a business cycle, uh, like let's say um, the construction industry like Caterpillar, Tractor, they, they're they very cyclical, right? And and so they don't tend to get very big PEs because it, it goes up and down. Okay. So their average PE is relatively low. Average high PE is relatively low. So we want to look and see if this company is one of those. 
Got it. And the way we can do that is we can look it up. Um, one of the best places I've found, it's on our website. You just go on that valuation page and it tells you what the range of PE is. So you just check it. It's right there. See, okay, I'm saying Apple is 28. Oh, and the range is as high as 56. Hmm. So, okay, now we know 28 wow. is fine. Yeah, okay. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> um, now, if you're not using our website, then where can you find this data? A little harder to find average PEs, but you can you can take a look at Yahoo. I haven't found where it is on there, but they may have it someplace. Um, where I go with our class, if you don't have our, our tools, is over to TD Ameritrade. And it's a pain, but you can create a free account over there. And then you can download, um, you just put in the symbol of the company like Apple. And then there's a thing that says analyst reports. Click on that as a menu item. And up will come a string of analyst reports. Pick the one that says S&P. And when you open it, it's a PDF and it opens up. Scroll down two or three pages and you'll see historical PE high and low. Hmm. And then you just look down the list and you'll see that, you know, oh, 28 is well within the range of Apple. Okay? Now, let me just briefly say about what PE is. PE is the multiple that you're willing to pay for the earnings. Right? Now, why would you pay a multiple of the earnings? Why wouldn't you just offer, you know, if Apple's making $8.65, why not offer somebody $8.65 for it? Why would you offer $16 or $24 or, like we said a minute ago, $86 or what people are paying today, which is like $115? Why would you offer a multiple of the earnings? And the answer is because... Earnings are real money, right? If you own the whole company, essentially, if your operating cash is, or free cash is often the same as earnings in great companies, you would get that $8.65 in your pocket. So why would you sell something for $8.65 that you're going to get anyway within 12 months? In fact, why would you sell something for $16 if you're going to get that anyway in two years? Or three years, 24, or four years, right? So you got it. It's just money. And people, we take our students through this exercise in class, it's really fun, where we put a hypothetical stock, hypothetical company, that one side of the class owns and wants to sell because they're 75 years old and they're getting out, and the other side of the class wants to buy. And we, we have them battle it out for the price. And it comes out within one or two PE numbers every time. Every class. In other words, what does one P, or two PE numbers like the mean? PE comes out? I don't want to tell you what it is because I'll wreck it. But the, let's say the PE that the class comes out with, the buyers and the sellers come out at about let's say fifteen times earnings every time. So we say the million here. This company has a million dollars of earnings. How much are you guys willing to pay for it? How much are you guys are willing to sell it for? And let's say hypothetically, it comes out at fifteen every single class we do, even though they're fully free to, to debate it and and work it out on their own what does, they're going to pay. Does one or two PE numbers mean like fifteen or sixteen? Fifteen, sixteen, oh, fourteen. I see. Yeah. Okay. I mean, it just comes right. It's like you're shooting arrows, and they're all yeah. going into the same. Well, place. didn't you say the average was seven and a half? The average growth rate is seven and a half. Oh, the average growth rate. And the average PE is fifteen. Mm-hmm. Oh, yeah. So maybe 15 shouldn't surprise us, right? So here's the thing. You don't pay, you, you have to pay a multiple for the company. And so with public companies, we just start with the fact that historical multiple is 15. And we work from there. So better companies have higher multiples than 15. And who, companies that are growing faster than 7.5% a year, and like Apple, at 14% a year, should have twice the PE ratio. And it, it has not a... 30, but it has a 28. Pretty close. Okay? okay. So let's, let's stipulate that that's how we find PE. And then we need one last number. And then we can do our calculation. The last number we call the minimum acceptable rate of return. This is, uh, and the, sh- the abbreviation is M-A-R-R. So minimal acceptable rate of return. That is, what's the minimum rate of return I'm willing to take per year to put my money into this company. So if I buy this company today with $100, what rate of return do I want per year over the next 10 years? And we we definitely look at 10 years. So we could say, well, um, what 
what should I start with to figure this out? And we'd start with a risk-free rate of return for 10 years, which is right now 2.1% on a 10-year U.S. government bond. Hmm. And a U.S. government bond is considered the risk-free rate. So, okay, I already know I don't want anything less than that because why would I put my money up for less than that? So, in fact, I want more than that because um, there's certainly more risk in what I'm doing. Even though we're going to do low risk, that's different than no risk. Okay, U.S. Treasury is considered no risk. So I've got some risk here, and I want I have to be compensated for the risk. Why would I put my money in a higher risk investment for a less return than a T-bill? Because there's no such thing as risk because we're doing our knowledge inquiry right now. <laughs> oh, no. Is that the wrong answer? <laughs> no. <laughs> it's a good answer. But we're still going to go in and bid as if there's a lot of risk. So it, it might surprise you, but the number that we use, um, and you're free to put in your own, is 15%. We want 15% per year to be our minimum acceptable rate of return. And we're going to judge the value of every business that we look at based on it has to provide us 15% per year, whatever price we say is the real price of this business, the real value of the business. If we buy it at that real value, our rate of return is 15% a year. Okay? So does that change if we think we've chosen a low-risk company Not for to us. put our money in? No. No. You, you could play that like game. Like if I'm in my risky biz portfolio and I decide to buy a tech stock... Do I want a higher minimum acceptable rate of return? Well, there's a really, really great professor over at NYU that would argue, yes, you would change it. But we are not going to go for that level of sophistication. Okay. That's one step too sophisticated. We're just going to stipulate. <laughs> we want 15% from everything. Okay. Okay. And the lower the risk, the better. And we're not going to change our requirement of 15%, even if we think, God, this is a no-brainer. Right? We're still going to demand that we get it at a great price. Okay. All right. So these are where we start to, to absorb some, or we start to put some conservative things back into the investment. So now how do we do this? Well, we start by saying we, we, we just grow the earnings per share for the next 10 years at the growth rate. So we said the growth rate of Apple is 14%. And the current earnings are $8.65. So now I'm going to grow those earnings for the next 10 years at 14% a year. Okay, so you could do it one year at a time, right? 14 and then you 14 on the new number and then 14 on the new number. Or you can do a compounded return on Excel, um, which is a formula that says, and you can look this up on, on our notes at rule1podcast.com. It says... You put in an equal Isn't sign. Isn't our website investedpodcast.com? Oh, what did I just say? Rule one podcast. Oh, yeah. It's, no, it's, it's investedpodcast.com. Podcast. There you go. Sorry. So you put in an equal sign, which tells Excel that you're going to put in a formula, and then you put in FV, parentheses, and up will come this formula. So just go on to the show notes, and you'll see how to do that. And the formula requires a rate, and the rate is the growth rate. So put that in, 14%. And then you put in a comma, and then it says in per. And in per means the number of periods, and we're going to do 10 years, so you put in 10. Okay. Comma. Then it says payment. There's no payments, so you put in comma. You just don't do anything. Just put comma. And then it says PV. And PV means what's the present number that we're going to grow? And that is $8.65. And the way Excel works is you got to start with a minus sign because it's money going out. So it's minus 865 and then you close the parentheses and hit the return button and it spits out the future earnings per share 10 years from now okay okay so i'm going to do it right now so i'm going to put in rate 14 percent in per 10 comma for payment and i'm putting in minus 8.65 per n and the number is 32 dollars and seven cents so if the analysts are correct about apple's growth it should be doing $32.07 per share in earnings 10 years out. So that would be whenever that is, right? 10 years from now. All right, $32.07. So now we have our, our first number, which is what the earnings will be in 10 years. Now, that's essentially saying that we've got this cash flow growth that goes all the way out for 10 years, and it results in this 10-year earnings of $32. Now, what would the business be worth per share if we've got $32 of earnings in 10 years? And the answer is 
32 times the PE. Because assuming Apple's continuing to grow at that rate, the PE will still be 28. So I multiply 32 times 28, and I get the stock price in 10 years, which is $897. Whoa! <laughs> Pretty cool. All right? Now, the stock price is $897. That's in 10 years. So think about this for a second. If we know we're going to sell something for essentially $900 in 10 years, what should I pay for that today if I want 15% a year? Mm -hmm. And the answer is really cool. The answer is divide by four. And it gives you the right answer. Or you can do an equals PV analysis, which will be a present value, and use the minimum acceptable rate of return of 15% in the formula. And I'll show you how to do that on show notes. But what we usually do is just divide by four, which turns out to be exactly right. And the reason it's exactly right is because if you grow something at 24, or sorry, at 15% per year, it turns out to double your money in five years. So if you grow a dollar at 15% every year for five years, you end up with $2 in five years. And so then if you continue to grow the $2 for another five years, you end up with four. And so if you've got $4 to start with 10 years out, how much should you pay for that $4 if you want 15% a year? The answer is one. Yeah. So you just divide by four. So eight ninety seven divided by four is two hundred twenty four dollars a share. Okay. Far out. That's what Apple is reasonably worth today, if the analysts are correct. Okay, a big if, but let's just stipulate. All right, two hundred twenty four dollars a share. Now, one fun fact is that Carl Icahn, who's a great investor, has recently come out after buying a big old pile of Apple and said Apple's worth about two hundred two hundred twenty dollars a share. <laughs> <laughs> so we've got some. We got some good investors behind us here. What's it selling at? It's selling at 115. Okay, so and we need to cut that number in half, right? And we do to find our. But this number, two hundred twenty-four dollars and forty-seven cents, is what we call the sticker price. So or, that's the sticker price. That's the sticker, and then we want to buy that for fifty percent discount. So if we divide that by two, so the margin of safety is the sticker price divided by two. And that's $112. So if Apple is at $112, we can buy it. And $115 is close enough. Okay. <laughs> We're allowed to round a little we bit. We can round a little. Okay. All right. So, Interesting. Yeah. Isn't that yeah, cool? Yeah. So this is now today. This is very dated information. So please remember, I'm not your financial advisor. This is not financial advice. Um, it's yeah, really and critical this, this because this is going to go up on the internet way after we're well, not way after, but ab not today. Yeah, so. <laughs> yeah, I mean, Apple could be at 150 this information when it goes is up. Definitely going to be wrong. It'll be dated. It'll be wrong, and and you can't act on it because remember, you can't move into a company where you don't have a really great understanding of the business. That's just rule number one for 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 everybody that does this. And I have not done serious homework on this. I'm just going through a rough skeleton outline of how you might do this. So this is educational purposes only, guys. And take that real seriously. Please do not run out there and buy this just because Carl Icahn says it's a good idea. You need to do your homework here. Okay. Having said that, there are worse things I've ever heard of. All right. <laughs> All right. Let's wrap it up there. All right. Very cool. That was, so that was that's how we got numbers. there. We're through it. We're through it. Now there's feel some good. more things. I feel like we need a break. Okay, good. <laughs> Yeah, um, what we're going to come back to, I think, is a little more about the event that might have put Apple on sale. What hmm. what would put Apple, why would smart people, just as smart as Carl, not wait and sell Apple at 200? Why are they selling it at 115? These are smart guys. They went to Wharton. I thought he just bought a lot of Apple. He did, but there's a lot of smart guys that oh, sold, sold it, it to him. him. Okay. <laughs> and we need to know why. And so that's called event. And we'll dive into that next time. And then down the road, we'll talk more about efficient market hypothesis, modern portfolio theory, and the train wreck that's created for your portfolio. Yeah, I think that's going to be an ongoing conversation. I do indeed. Well, until then, time to go play. Thanks, everybody. Bye. Bye. Hey, you guys. Thanks for listening to Invested, the rule number one podcast. If you like us, please subscribe. Please and leave a review for us on iTunes. Uh, by the way, you can get our notes and links for this podcast and post comments about this show and uh, also get more information about how to invest on your own by going to investedpodcast.com. Um, by the way, everything, this is important, everything discussed on this show is either my opinion or Danielle's opinion 
and it isn't to be taken as investment advice because I am not your investment advisor, nor have I considered your personal situation as your fiduciary. This podcast is for entertainment and education only. I, I got to tell you, I really hope you enjoyed it. And I know Danielle does too. So until next week, it's time to go play. See ya.